Hello and welcome to Deft and Dorky. We're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. We're back. I'm back with Brian. We're going to talk some, some more D&D stuff. Today, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm super good. I have a problem, though. Do you? Yeah, we got to figure out what we're calling these, because on the uh, stream tonight, what did you call it? A talkie thing? <laughs> yeah i don't want to say podcast it's not on it's not wherever you can get your podcasts but it is a we podcast released, essentially you can, you can so. podcast via just youtube or whatever that's yeah, fine all right maybe that's we'll just call we it just the we just don't make ourselves available to everyone <laughs> you know we're we are you know, you know the village bicycle i had like <laughs> i had clever names but none of them like so like uh discuss and discover huh huh <laughs> yeah sticking with a the theme i see because there's two d's yeah. nice. uh debate and disclose <laughs> you're really rocking that two d's <laughs> <laughs> dialogue and divulge discourse and delve all all possible things but none of them anyway Sticking around and <laughs> donkin. Anyway, donk, donk. <laughs> today we are talking about bothersome rules. Uh, so anyone who's played D and D for any length of time has realized that there are some rules that kind of either oh. aren't intuitive or they don't make the most sense, or they're they seem like strictly there for balance. Anyway. We're gonna talk about some of them. Um, we're gonna talk about first. You want to talk about identify? I mean, we can, because but I think that's like a less. That's an example of one where you really got to think about it. Not so like obvious let's, off the cuff. Let's dive into it. Identify. Okay. So, yeah, and I want to address this because I have I'm running two campaigns right now. Mm -hmm. Um, both are with three players. No one in this in these groups. Are playing a wizard and so unless they pick up a feat they don't have access to the spell identify <laughs> so i asked you like a week or two ago i was yeah. like hey what do you what do you do with this because I, I mean like what dm doesn't want to give magic items to their players or what player doesn't want a magic item <laughs> like what do you do and like you i mean you told me it's like, well, you just decide. Like, do you want to just give them straight up the info about the items? And I'm like, I guess, but that just kind of eliminates this cool spell. So I just like, what is the purpose of identify? Was one of those things where it's just like, it's kind of a, it's kind of a clunky rule, depending on how you want to run your game. Yeah. So let's let's read identify first. So it's yeah. uh, <clears throat> you choose one object that you must touch throughout uh, the casting of the spell. If it is a magic item or some other magic imbued object, you will learn its properties and how to use them, whether it requires attunement to use and how many charges it has, if any. You learn whether any spells are affecting the item and what they are. If the item was created by a spell, you learn which spell created it. If you instead touch a creature throughout the casting, you learn what spells, if any, are currently affecting it. So. It's, I mean, that's a... An underused uh, part of this is I I didn't even realize yeah. much later than I, when I was playing D and D that you can use it on a person and see if there's any spells affecting them, but yeah, like you could identify like a curse or something. Well, that's the thing. Possibly. It's usually not always, but usually cursed items will say identify does not find the curse. I so at that point, what I mean, is identify them, for? So if if it doesn't identify curses and most people play that if you like attune with an attune to an item, you effectively identify it. But okay. I don't think that's necessarily always the case. Cause I was looking through some magic items and I found okay. a cursed one that it doesn't say that like it, it, um, let me look for it again. It was the uh, blasting goggles. Okay. Uh, blasting Googles. Oops. Where are they? Nope. It's not blast blasted goggles. Blasting goggles. 
should have had this ready to go, but it's an uncommon item, and I know it's in the first. There's 38, thing. the DMG. So Blasted goggles. Okay, so what does it say? Cursed. The goggles are cursed, and becoming attuned to them extends the curse to you. You can't remove the goggles around your attunement until targeted by remove curse spell or similar magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't say anything in there against about like not being able to pick that up with identify. I think that it's in the DMG, which I'm trying. I thought I had all this stuff pulled up already, but I missed this one. Um, and I don't know what page numbers these are because this is not listed in that fashion. I think it's under. Something else. Let's. Well, I look it up here. Um, page one thirty-eight of the DMG is what, is what this says. Um, most methods of identifying items, including the identify spell, fail to reveal such a curse. Although lore might hint at it, that's what it says in the DMG. Well then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> most me- yeah, most methods of identifying items, including the identify spell, fail to re- to reveal such a curse. Um, at which you would point, never know that unless you read page one thirty eight of the DMG. Yes, right. <laughs> Jeez, um, please, man. So, given that, and the fact that, again, most people will play that if you if you attune to an item, you understand it, you effectively identify it. What is the point of identify? I'm like still so floored by that last component. Like, <laughs> it doesn't say it in the spell description at all. Nope. How would you know? Well, you wouldn't, unless you're a dungeon you master and have the dungeon master's guide. <laughs> and how many? Like, I've been DMing for a while. I haven't read the DM. <laughs> like, I got it. it does. Anyway, sorry. So, at the, yeah, but at that point, what good is identify? Like. So the one thing that I did think of was like if I ever give them like an item that has lore implications, it might be important for them to be able to like, oh, we found this mystical relic or whatever. Like, how mm-hmm. would you ever know anything more about it? Well, there's a spell called Legend Lore that would let you know with like, more things about it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, mean, I guess Identify doesn't necessarily do that either. Nope. It just tells you like, if that what what's magic about it essentially. So it's, I mean. So I asked my wife this because she's in the one. So in the one campaign, I just gave them an item. I made up a magic item on the spot that like identifies anything. Okay. Like no, no limitation. Okay. And the other one, I gave them some goggles that were in one of the critical role adventures that you can do that once per day. Okay. Identify. And like, I feel like giving them the magic item that just kind of auto identifies just kind of feels like why, why bother? Why not just like give them the description? Right, mm-hmm. which I think is a valid question, and I don't know the answer to. <laughs> and then the other one, like I asked my wife about it, she's like, "What did you, what did you think?" And she's like, "Ah, oh, it's kind of cool. Like it kind of like stretches it out, and we got to be strategic, especially because it's a scenario where they got this stuff, and there is a chance that, like, it was a portable hole, and I put like eight magic items in it, and okay. this was supposed to be delivered to somebody, right. and." I wasn't sure if they were even to bother looking for it, knowing full well that it belonged to someone else. But they're like, "Yeah, frick it, let's freaking go for it," you know. <laughs> um, and they're gonna run into that person in like two days, and there's only there's eight items, so they get to like, "Oh, which one should we look at?" <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know. Like, so, if it can't if identify can't find. I mean. <laughs> identify can't identify cursed items and there's things like legend lore or other stuff that identify i don't think identify could tell you the history of the item or like no it's not designed to do that it's what legend lore is for so from a storytelling perspective it's very cool like you can you can look at a thing and and tell what it is but mechanically Mm -hmm. if you're in a party that doesn't have this does that then make it to where you essentially don't get to use magic items or yeah. does it or does it make it completely irrelevant and you can just attune to it and figure it out yourself is is the what dilemma. did you say about 
what did you say about attunement? Like if somebody so, attunes to it? Yeah, it's a. I mean, I don't. I don't know if it's actually in the rules, but it's a common uh, house rule. If not, that if you attune, if you take the time to, to attune to an object, you essentially identify it. I'm gonna look it up in the basic. So the, rules. the downside of that is that if you attune to an object without, <laughs> well, th- theoretically, if you attune to an object without identifying it, you might be attuning to something bad or cursed. But if identify doesn't tell you it's cursed then it doesn't really matter (laughs) well no i mean like in that instance like i think so with that house rule like if you attune to it and then you get to know everything about it Mm -hmm. you you take the gamble of like this could be cool but it also could be cursed which i think is kind of a fun i i don't mind that Mm -hmm. but all right now that we're going to the dmg on this crap (laughs) but also like so what about items that don't require attunement? How do you identify those? If you don't have identifying the thing, do you just not get to know what that stuff is? I guess this most of the time, most of the time, like a, a good way to do it is either to give your party an item that can identify stuff, which is mm-hmm. kind of just eliminates the, the mechanic or what I would prefer to do myself is give them some sort of NPC that right. can do it so many times a day. If they, either pay him or her or they they become friend they like befriend the person right right a hub yeah like, yeah is, yeah which in a way it's like it's almost like wow like turn in your token and then yeah which kind of sucks but, a little bit especially if you don't have even like someone in your party that is capable of getting that spell because <clears throat> it just makes it <clears throat> a mandatory thing that you have to oh we got to go talk to yeah captain identify again I will say this, I think, is. so in my campaign, both of these, both of these campaigns are with relatively newer players. I think it would be kind of cool to have, like, a knowledgeable person. You know what I mean? Like, they could be the source of information, and I think that each of these parties would think it was kind of fun to have that. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think that they would look at that as like, okay, here's the uh, identify uh, vending machine, you know? <laughs> I think it'd be like, oh, hey, we got to go talk to Radagast or Gandalf or whatever. Yeah. Bring it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what uh, I would do just because it's, as far as storytelling, I think it's interesting uh, to yeah. have like, oh man, we don't, we got these, because not, because in most worlds, the vast majority of people have no idea what a magic item is because mm-hmm. they're supposed to be somewhat rare, right? Uh, it so, depends on your world, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but. so I think it's cool to have, oh, we got these cool items that like don't break and they don't even collect very much dust. It's, they're super weird. Mm-hmm. We should take it to someone who knows about magic and see if he can tell us what is the deal with these. I think that's a, you know, a fun thing to do, oh. but we, it, we it should does, talk about, it does make the spell a little weird for if <sighs> It's almost like you either <laughs> you have it and it makes most of the things sort of irrelevant or you don't have it, at which point it's so. Eh, yeah, we've we've said all the things about it. It's it's a little weird. I, I yeah. still like it and I will. Um, the way I've sort of homebrewed it uh, for finding things that identify typically doesn't do is if whoever's casting identify and make them roll an arcana check. And if it's high enough, they can see that it has whatever, like if, if there's a curse on there, if it's a super high curse, maybe the DC is a little higher, but I'm trying to get into the habit of making people roll arcana checks. Anytime they identify something for the chance that there might be something more than just the, the typical identify spell can show. So, I mean, and because with that too, like if you're going to give them a chance to roll, like that's something that I thought about as well. So one of the, like the critical roll item, it's another set of goggles. You can do identify once per day. And it also gives you advantage on arcana checks to, uh, give me one <laughs> second while I look this up. Um, 85E identify goggles. These are the ones the, uh, I think that, uh, FCG wears. Mm-hmm. Which he sort of reskinned to just a lens, which is cool because he's a he's a robot. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, while a creature is wearing them, they have advantage on Arcana checks made to learn information about an object or creature in their sight. <laughs> okay. So, like, <laughs> so that's a double what dips do you there a bit. Tell them <laughs> if they roll Arcana, um, and they roll really well. It's like hey, I got an at twenty on my Arcana. It's like okay. What I would do is be is treat it like a maybe it has runes on it. Be like, yeah, this is definitely okay, rolled that twenty on your Arcana check. This is definitely magic. You can tell by the the craftsmanship, the way it's repelling dust, whatever. And you can be like, it may you see some runes sketched on it that with the natural twenty you can see are you know whatever school of magic. It's abjuration. Uh, runes on it, so you have an mm -hmm. idea of what it does. It's probably the way I would rule that. Yeah, I mean, that's... I find that acceptable, I suppose. <laughs> I I will say this, like, I think identify as an unnecessary hurdle for one of my groups because I gave them that thing that gives them the chance to do it every day mm -hmm. for free. Um... But one thing I do, I didn't know that stuff about like, hey, it can tell you what spells are affecting something. Yeah. So that's an interesting use of the spell that I've never thought about before. Yeah, because most like most people don't even know about it. They're like, oh, we got magic items. Get identify over here, so we. Can, <laughs> that's what that's for. I think I could like honestly, tricky puzzles or anything like that. That'd like, be kind of a cool component of a puzzle. It's like. Yeah. Hey, can we get some help, DM? Yeah, roll Arcana. I got a seventeen. Okay, you you know that this is under some kind of spell effect, and something like Identify can tell you what the effect is. Yeah, that's a um, that's definitely a cool use for it. Um, is Identify touch? It is touch. Yes, Freak. that sucks. Because <laughs> like in a weird way, like it'd be kind of cool if you're just like, man. We're fighting this thing. Why can't I freaking hit it or whatever? <laughs> or what's going on? Like, identify 30 feet. You could be like, hey, by the way, it's protected by whatever. Like, <laughs> that'd be kind of cool, too. Yeah. Well, so that, that's our that's the beef with identify. You got anything else to, to say about uh, identify? I'm just uh, I'm not sure what to do about it. That's all. <laughs> if you guys have ideas, you can put it in the comments. There you go. Also, Quick side note, I think we should return to this idea of like, so you mentioned, I think a lot of people play the, their games in wor worlds where magic items are common, or at least common enough that like people know about them, mm -hmm. you know? I like your idea of like, the freak, the sword didn't break, or whatever. <laughs> like, I am intrigued by the idea of a campaign where like game mechanics that are cool slash don't make sense are truly, like I've had this idea for a campaign where it's just like, party gets in a wicked bad fight they lose a bunch of hp standard long rest rules they get like stacked up somewhere it's like hey thanks for saving our lives you can stay in the inn for free no problem the next morning even though they were all on death's door they're like perfectly fine and then people see that as like what the freak we need to dissect <laughs> these people and figure out what's you know what i mean like, capture them <laughs> yeah <laughs> like stuff like that where it's just like so anyway, <laughs> I'm interested to hear what you had to say about because you you came up with this topic and like what what are some of those bothersome game rules that you feel like? All right, we'll move on to the next one. It is hiding. Oh, <laughs> yeah, dude. so hiding, dude. I'll go off, okay, we'll just we'll do some reading here. So hiding yeah. in the in the. Uh, the PHB, the player's handbook. When you take mm -hmm. the hide action, you make a dexterity stealth check in an attempt to hide following the rules for hiding. If you succeed, you gain certain benefits as described in the unseen attackers and targets section later in the chapter. So let's read about hiding rules. Yeah. The DM decides when circumstances are appropriate for hiding. When you try to hide, make a dexterity stealth check. Until you are discovered or you stop hiding, that check's total is contested by the wisdom perception check of any creature that actively searches for signs of your presence. You can't hide from a creature that you can see clearly. Uh, and you give away your position if you make noise, such as shouting a warning or knocking over a vase. 
an invisible creature can always try to hide. Signs of its passage might still be noticed and does have uh, to stay quiet. In combat, most creatures stay alert for signs of danger all around, so if you come out of hiding and approach a creature, it usually sees you. However, under certain circumstances, the DM might allow you to stay hidden as you, ex <clears throat> as you approach a creature that is distracted, allowing you to gain advantage on an attack roll before you are seen. So then it also talks about passive perception, uh, which is when you hide, basically you, your TC is uh, up against whatever creature's passive perception it is. Uh, and if that creature has advantage on perception for whatever reason, add five to their passive, disadvantage, subtract five. Uh, one of the main factors in determining whether you can find a hidden creature or object is how well you can see in an area which might be lightly or heavily obscured, as explained in Chapter 8. So, <laughs> it's so <laughs> obtuse. Um, so we'll start here with hiding. Mm -hmm. It's like an essential <laughs> thing for rogues, right? Like, that's how right. they do their yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't hide from a creature you can cl you can see, or that can see you clearly, is what it says. Mm-hmm. So it means you have to break line of sight in some manner. There are some things like going behind a wall. Okay, you can you can try to hide. At that point, though, like if either you can see it or you can't, right? <laughs> I don't know if you. <laughs> so it's just a very weird topic because if you go behind a wall mm -hmm. and hide. And you succeed to beat the monster's passive perception. It still knows where it last saw you and can just walk over there. And if you're still sitting there, <laughs> are you still hidden? This, I don't think so. Is, yeah. Is this in the context <laughs> of combat or? Yeah. I, so I don't, okay. Two things about this. One, I think that like we are playing a game. And every game has rules. Mm -hmm. And you just gotta put like you gotta put some rules on stuff. I don't mind stuff like this in combat. Because it's just like, you know, when people are like, Well, you know, if you tell a thousand peasants to hold their action to throw a spear and they all hand an exit <laughs> and then your spear moves at the speed of light, I'm like, You guys That's fine, honestly. I don't mind. Like those are the rules and we have to have the rules to make the game work, you know? Mm -hmm. Um but for me too, like if you're a rogue, like I think that like I always envisioned it's kind of cool. Like, okay, bad guy sees the rogue running, and the rogue runs behind a pillar. Bad guy is ready for the rogue to like be on the other side of the pillar, and rogue pulls a sh uh, shifty one and kind of like real quickly pirouettes back the other way and shoots. And mm -hmm. like the whole point of combat rogue stuff is for sneak attack, right? Yeah. So the the idea for me, it doesn't bother me so much there. Because I feel like if the whole point is for them to get like an ethically questionable advantage on their bolt or arrow or stabby stab or whatever, <laughs> I'm honestly okay with it. Because it's just like, yeah, in your instance, it's like, oh, they went behind that wall. I'm pretty sure they're over there. But I can't see exactly where they might be shooting me from. Mm -hmm. I can only guess. And so in that instance, I'm like, yeah, I think that you deserve advantage in that, because it's just like, if you're coming at me like a barbarian, I'm like, he's swinging that axe, I'm pretty sure, oh, he's got it behind <laughs> his head, this is coming, this is coming top down. <laughs> got a pretty good idea, but he's strong, so am I going to be able to block this, or whatever, however you want to narrate that. But for a rogue, it's like, okay, they hid behind one box that's in the middle of nowhere, I've got a really freaking good idea of where it's at, but like... Maybe he's going to shoot that hand crossbow from the bottom right, or maybe he's going up down, or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't mind that as much in combat. For for that purpose, I think it's fine, especially um, if it's, like, the the bonus action before the attack. Because as a rogue, you can bonus action hide, as opposed to using mm -hmm. your action to do it, which is sure. how you get your sneak attack a lot of the time. So if you... But the, the weird thing is, though, let's say you're hidden at the beginning of a combat, like, they haven't seen you at all. And the, the rest of your party is attacking or whatever. And you pop out of your hiding spot, shoot them, and then hide, bonus action hide after you've shot back behind the same wall. Mm -hmm. 
are the are you hidden to the effect of they will they because they know that they know where they saw you because you shot them yeah would you rule that they could then walk over to that wall and then be in line of sight of you and you were no longer hidden all right walk this through for me again so, i was with you and then i got lost so you're hiding the beginning of a combat. You're already hidden somewhere. You're behind a wall. Sure. Pop out, yeah. shoot the guy. Then use your bonus mm-hmm. action to pop back behind the wall and hide again. And it's successful. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's the monster's turn. Yeah. They're like that rogue thing, whatever that hit me harder than ever. Anybody else. I need to take care yeah, of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do they walk over to the wall and then see you crouching there? <laughs> or are you I think hidden? Fine. And they, they walk over to the wall and like, I have no idea. <laughs> where that guy went <laughs> i i have no problem with that what you said i think it would be dumb for the monster to not be like i mean you play it according to like if if you're fighting a zombie it might be like oh where'd it go but if you're <laughs> fighting a beholder or whatever it'd be like that's a problem and i'm an intelligent sentient being mm-hmm. i'm going to go suss that out yeah so that's kind of how i how i feel about it and i play a rogue on uh on Thursday nights Mm -hmm. in in Michael's campaign. And that's the way I kind of do it. I kind of, because it, it didn't make a lot of sense to me that like hiding and then shooting. So I kind of have been describing it the way you did, where it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to jump behind this tree and I'm going to act like I'm going full speed, but then I'm going to bonus action hide. And then I'm going to double back and come out the, the, that same side and try to shoot at it. And that's the way I've been doing it. And I've been, I've been, I, it's satisfied me. (laughs) Well, and I also think like your environment can define it. Like if it's like, hey, there's a solitary rock here in the middle of this cave, like a creature's ability to find you on their turn is probably going to be a lot easier. Like I would lower the DC for whatever the creature had to do, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you're like, oh no, we're fighting in a museum warehouse and I can just freaking like, you know. Yeah, and There's it's thousands of boxes and crates and the aisle ways. It's <laughs> like, okay, it's probably gonna be harder for the creature to find your at. I don't know. Yeah, and it's like if there's a bunch of bushes too. Like I sometimes dive into yeah, bushes yeah. and I'm like, I'm yeah. in the bushes. <laughs> you can't see I'm me. In the bush. <laughs> I am bush wookie warrior. So I also wanted to touch on the unseen attackers and targets rules as they relate to this come uh, combatants often try to escape their foes notice by hiding, casting the invisibility spell or lurking in darkness. When you attack a target that you can't see, you have disadvantage on the attack roll. This is true. Whether you're guessing the target's location or you're targeting a creature you can hear, but not see if the target isn't in the location you target, you automatically miss, but the DM typically just says that the attack missed. Uh, not whether you guessed the target's location correctly. Uh, when a creature you can't, when a creature can't see you, you have advantage on attack rolls against it. If you are hidden, both unseen and unheard, when you make an attack, you give away your location when the attack hits or misses. Makes sense to me. So that is a, a thing that we kind of touched on when I was playing in your campaign. <laughs> Yeah, which is I mean, it makes sense, but at the same time, I guess I mean I guess casting a spell using a uh, an action for a spell slot is as big a commitment as a bonus action hide, except that it lasts longer. <laughs> yeah, I mean I personally, I think if your spell is going to be a projectile of sorts. Or you're going to target on a specific spot. Mm-hmm. I would allow for an opportunity. Like if it's if it's going to involve an attack roll, but in the spell description it says you must like you target one creature within sixty feet that you can see and hurl a bolt of ice mm-hmm. at it. I would still allow for a, a disadvantaged attack roll. If okay. you're like, <laughs> if it, if 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 the monster targets. The relative area okay. like in, in in that i think how big was the radius of your darkness uh i think i don't remember what that particular one was because it's weird homebrew thing uh, but the typical yeah. range is 20 feet 20 feet so i think like 
the monster is going to shoot a firebolt at where you were. And if you hadn't moved, I would give the monster disadvantage on the attack roll. Okay. What if I had moved? I would just... I'd probably auto-miss. Okay. What if I moved and I was wearing tap shoes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess if they could hear you. Like, I suppose if it was like, okay, the monster's going to try to figure it out, I would give it a perception check first as a free action. I don't know. Like, I think if you're like, okay, that guy's hiding in this cloud of smoke. All right, I've got five cronies. Let's just mow him down, like, machine gun <laughs> mob style. But if there was a certain thing where it's just like, like if the if let's say polymorph or whatever, it's like mm-hmm. I think you've got to be able to like, I think you're magically turning somebody inside out and into something else. Like I think you've got to be able to see them yes. for that spell. Certainly, if it's not a an attack roll, yeah, and it's not and it's not an AOE, I think that mm-hmm. sight has is mandatory. It needs to make a saving throw. Yeah. yeah. Or sorry, if it needs to make a saving throw, I think the sight is mandatory. Yeah. Unless it's an a... AOE. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm trying oh. to think of an example of a spell that would just require a saving throw that I would probably be like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I don't and know. I can't. I can't either. How would you rule... Hmm, this is interesting. Like, How would you rule um, Fairy Fire versus standing in the spell Darkness? I need to read Fairy Fire. <laughs> I need to read it. That's a good question. Um, uh, well, let's go to Fairy Fire. F A E R I E Fire. Is that it? I think so. There, yeah, that's how they spell it. Okay. Each object in a 20 foot cube within range is outlined in blue, green, or violet light. Your choice. Any creature in the area when the spell is cast is also outlined in light if it fails a deck saving throw. With the duration, objects and affected creatures shed dim light in a 10-foot radius. Any attack roll against the affected creature or object has advantage if the attacker can see it and the affected... This is a good question. So then let's look at darkness. Just listen to the rhythm of my heart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Magical darkness spreads from a point you choose within range to fill a... Oh, it's 15-foot radius sphere for the duration. Uh, The darkness spreads around corners. A creature with dark vision can't see through this darkness, and non-magical light can't illuminate it. Non-magical light can't illuminate it. There you go. If the point you choose is on an object you are holding or one that isn't being worn or carried, the darkness emanates from the object and moves with it, completely covering the source of the darkness with an opaque object such as a bowl or a helm blocks the darkness, so it's like an anti-torch. If any of this spell's area overlaps with an area of light created by a spell of second level or lower, the spell that created the light is dispelled. Okay, well there so you go. Fairy, fairy fire is first level. level. What if they upcast it? I mean, I think if you upcast <laughs> it, it overrides that, right? I don't know. <laughs> I, I would. Guess. I would rule that. I would rule so, that because I feel like, oh, non-magical. Oh, wait, so does it second mean, level or lower? Does it mean that you see a ball of darkness with like violet outlines? Yeah. That's what I would do. That's kind I mean, of cool. I would, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of dig it. In my mind, I've always viewed this as like <laughs> predator vision a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> like, I see you. <laughs> you couldn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, kill me. Um, yeah. So, so what I, if? That's kind of cool. What if you I'm are having more fun behind? This, by the way. <laughs> What if you're behind, you're in a darkness bubble, but you're behind boxes. Someone upcasts fairy fire. It outlines you and the boxes. Can you tell if you are like, if can you tell if the boxes are in between you and your target, or does it just look like they're in a basically the same plane? Like, oh, could you? I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, any creature in the area with a spell I uh, I don't like 
<laughs> this is getting hard. <laughs> For all, I mean, super common scenario too. Like, <laughs> fire always taken, and darkness regularly happens all the time. <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay. Just if it were me in that scenario, yeah. <laughs> I think if it were me in that scenario, I would say, like, when it comes to hiding, and we've been talking about it in the context of a rogue anyway, I think that this would diminish. I think this would diminish their ability to do a sneak attack. Okay. That's probably how I would rule it. One more question about darkness before I move on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What if you upcast darkness? Does it then get rid of stuff that is like if you upcast it at fifth level, say maybe you're a warlock? <laughs> uh, yeah. Does it does it then dispel fifth level and lower? Yeah. What is what, is darkness second level? Yeah. Yeah, I would probably match it then. Okay. Fair. <laughs> that's probably what I would do. But interesting, yeah, interesting, you do whatever uh, the hell you want. Interesting interactions. Yeah. It's like magic isn't fully fleshed yeah. out because it's not real. Um, all right. Who would have thought? See, that's the thing about this thing. <laughs> I don't. I think sometimes they can make for fun conversations, but when mm-hmm. people take it too seriously and start applying like real world earth physics to the mm-hmm. game of D. I'm like guys we had to come up with like they had to come up with rules <laughs> like I know whatever it is doesn't make sense like oh if I have a 20 strength score I can lift 80,000 pounds or whatever it's like no no like it <laughs> just we had to put numbers on it that were tangible and easily grasped like <laughs> yep. I don't know I say I say we as if I had anything to do with it. <laughs> so but anyway all right so i i think that covers uh hiding pretty well and, and yeah. a little tangent into darkness versus fairy fire darkness um, also sucks. just in general seeing things in D D is sometimes like can i see it <laughs> like, oh uh no why do you describe it then <laughs> exactly. um okay so that is that i also want to talk about mm-hmm. um concentration and how it interacts with readying a spell yeah what's the ruling on that or is there one so um okay so some spells require I'll I'll just read the concentration rules first some Mm -hmm. spells require you to maintain concentration in order to keep their magic active if you lose concentration such a spell ends if a spell must be maintained with concentration that fact appears in its duration, blah, 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 blah. It, it tells you that it. <laughs> uh, you can end mm-hmm. uh, concentration at any time, no action required. Normal activity, such as moving and attacking, doesn't interfere with concentration. The following factors can break concentration. Casting another spell that requires concentration. Okay, that makes sense. You lose okay, concentration yes. on a spell if you cast another spell that requires concentration. You can't concentrate on two spells at once. That's part of the balancing. Yeah. Taking damage. Uh, whenever you take damage, you are concentrating on a spell. You must make a con save that equals DC plus the half the damage you took, minimum of 10. Um, yeah, 10 or half the damage you took. Okay. Uh, being incapacitated or killed. Uh, if you lose concentration, if you are incapacitated or if you die. Mm-hmm. Yep, the DM might sense. also uh, decide that there are certain er- environmental phenomena, such as a wave crashing over you while your storm-tossed ship, uh, require you to succeed on a DC 10 saving throw to maintain concentration on a spell. Sure. That all makes that all that all works. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up the rules for readying an action because I thought I had those, but I don't. But Mm. the readying an action, I think it's in here. Uh, Ready. Okay, there it is. Um, So you can use your action to ready something in in response. uh, You can name the trigger and all that, just readying a normal action. When you ready a spell, 
you cast it as normal, but hold its energy, uh, which you release with your reaction when the trigger occurs. To be readied, a spell must have a casting time of one action, and holding on to the spell's magic requires concentration. If your concentration is broken, the spell dissipates without taking effect. For example, if you are concentrating on the web spell and ready magic missiles, your web spell ends. And you take da- and if you take damage before you release magic missiles with your reaction, your concentration might be broken. How this do you feel makes about me that? So angry. <laughs> that makes me so bad. Honestly, I hate it. Cuz I'm gonna like when I think about like okay if I were to be like I'm gonna ready my action I'm gonna swing at him if he gets close to me mm-hmm. like if we're going by the same logic then the guy that's like getting ready to swing is just in this perpetual like <laughs> you know just like <laughs> hack, 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 and maybe he'll run into my sword <laughs> and I just like to me I'm like why would you why wouldn't you just continue to stand there the way that you're planning on standing you know like why would you telegraph your so in my mind i've always viewed it as like i would like to ready a spell i'm going to ready uh guiding bolt in case something comes into view like i don't like that if it doesn't go off it uses the spell slot Mm -hmm. i don't like i don't like any of this (laughs) break (laughs) <laughs> because in my mind it's just like you know what in in my head my baby is crying again gosh dang um i don't like that to me it feels like it should it should act the same way that like shooting a bow and arrow does to me in my mind okay you know what i mean i just think like why not just let them cast the spell the second that you see them kind of thing? You're sacrificing your action. I think this is a no-fun mechanic. I don't <laughs> like it. But I will also feed to you that this is a personal opinion of mine. So <laughs> Sure. Because <laughs> I'm like, okay, I guess if you want to rule it, they're like, oh, you got to like conjure up your swirly misty whatever and you're holding this ball of energy in your hands you don't get to have the web spell anymore like fine so i think it would be okay if you're using a if you're if you're writing a spell it would be okay if it doesn't cost you your um, spell slot and it doesn't break your concentration, but that uses your reaction. Like, there's no chance to use your reaction for anything else, no matter what. Someone starts to cast yeah. teleport, yeah. no counter spell. You're, you're using your reaction you're, already. You're committed to that, yeah. I think that's fine. I think, and I've gone, I go back and forth on this because. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, that's dumb. Why don't you just let them do it? And then I'm like, I I will come across some situation well where it's like, well, <laughs> I think I think there are very certain things that are listed as a reaction. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I think that if you were to let them sit there and be like, I'm gonna cast guiding bolt as my reaction. And then like, oh, never mind, change my mind, counter spell. Like I just think like, no, you've committed. Like, you have intentionally used your action to focus on this. Mm-hmm. You know? I I think that's fine. If you're going to hold your action, that is your reaction. Yeah, I think, I'm that, okay I think it's that. okay to not burn the spell slot, especially if you're... Yeah. Just because there's, like... There are spells that take, you know, ten minutes to cast or whatever, and if you're... And those are technically under concentration as well while you're casting it. And if your concentration is broken before you finish, it says in there that it doesn't take your spell slot. Mm, so the concentration aspect is coming from the fact that you've it takes an action to cast, but you've already cast it. Your concentration is holding that spell and not releasing the magical energy to where its target is. I don't like it, Isaac. <laughs> I don't like this. Yeah, I'm not a fan of it either. Um, 
however you rule it at your table. It's Let me fine, ask you this, everybody. But if yeah. someone were to have concentration up on a spell, say mm-hmm. web, I guess. Sure. And they wanted to, as their reaction, cast a different concentration spell. Mm-hmm. When does web fall? I would say the second they cast the second one. Like, not not at, on their turn, but whenever they... So let's say I'm going to hold low for when the big bad comes in, and I've already got his crony webbed up. Mm-hmm. If, the big, if the big bag walks around the corner slow goes web drops that's how okay. i would roll it that's but right that's I like me. That. and this is obviously flying in the face of the rules but <laughs> this is one of those rules that I, I don't like either and i think that and I, i'm not sure it's ever actually come up in one of my games but if it does i don't think actually i think that people have held spells before and i'm not i've just been like that's whatever because it does it feels bad to, to punish a caster um from doing what their normal stuff is mm-hmm. which i guess is part of the balance between Marshall and Caster because casters have a lot more utility in their in their their belt than a, most Marshals mm-hmm. do. Right. So maybe that's part of the way that they try to balance it, but I don't like it. I don't like it either. <laughs> I don't like it either. Like I think it's funny in this topic. I think there's a couple things where it's just like I think this topic encapsulates like rules that we just flat out disagree with, mm-hmm. and then stuff where it's just like yo like. <laughs> like I think that's one where I'm just like yeah I just think that's dumb and then there's things like <laughs> identify like we talked about earlier where it's just mm-hmm. like so what's the point <laughs> it's like in this particular party where I gave them the thing where it's like once a day and like eight magic items at once mm-hmm. two of my players were super into it and the other one like could not care less and I felt like it way majorly slowed things down for him for like 20 minutes <laughs> and he admittedly like checked out and I was like I get it I'm glad you two are having a blast and I'm sorry that you are not uh, <laughs> anyway that is, that's the thing that sometimes so. happens not a lot you can do about it yeah um, okay I'm satisfied with the with talking about concentration and how it applies to readying a spell <laughs> yeah. uh, one other thing though um mm-hmm. And this is the thing I've sort of toyed with a little bit in making uh, custom items is making an item that allows you to concentrate on more than one spell. Yeah. The issue comes in. There's I'm I am 100 percent certain that there's gonna there are some busted combos, right? All right. All right. So, like I have wanted for a long time to cast haste and holy weapon. <laughs> I'm I sure, yeah, that's busted combo. <laughs> Um, I guess a way you could do it is that, and I think they did this in season one, campaign one of Critical Role. I think someone, I think one of the guys had a, an item that allowed them to, if they were concentrating on a spell and they cast another concentration spell, they could maintain concentration on the first one for another like turn or two. And then it went away. That's cool. I dig that. So that may be something that comes up at some point. Anyway. Yeah. Moving on. The last thing, uh. In one of the Dimension 20 shows, uh, one of the characters has an item that does it. Like, the item holds concentration on a spell for them. Mm. So they can... Like, it would would lock in. So it's like, okay, I'm going to cast Haste. It's going to hold it. Yeah. And it would lock that in. I suppose that's like... I mean... It's not so uncommon to have an item do that, but for a specific spell, not one that you can choose, I guess. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. In this instance, it would whatever the person chose. Well, that's so, pretty handy but... then. Uh, okay, so the last uh, sort of rule thing I wanted to talk about that was a bit off for me mm-hmm. uh, was advantage and disadvantage and how they stack, or rather don't stack. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, Rules is written. Sometimes a special ability or spell tells you that you have advantage or disadvantage on an ability check, a saving throw, or an attack roll. When that happens, you roll a second d20 when you make the roll. Uh, you, we already know how advantage works. If multiple situations uh, affects a roll, 
and each one grants advantage or imposes disadvantage on it, uh, you don't roll more than one additional d20. If two favorable situations grant advantage, for uh, for example, you still only roll one additional d20. If certain uh, circumstances cause that roll to have both advantage and disadvantage, you are considered uh, to have neither of them, and you roll one. This is true even if multiple circumstances impose disadvantage and only one grants advantage, or vice versa. Uh-oh. In such a situation, you have neither advantage or disadvantage. I gotta say I like that rule just because yeah. it can get ridiculous. <laughs> like the amount of things that you have to balance out. This <laughs> and felt for like the a most rule. part, I I go I do use the, the rules as written there. Sometimes I will allow different stuff. Uh, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say this feels like a rule, so they came up with an idea of advantage disadvantage. And eventually someone was like, What happens if this happens? And they were like, Let's lean in favor of simplicity. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know? I am all for it because like I think if the point of playing a game is to have fun, then you know what would not be fun is like trying to calculate, okay, I've got four instances of advantage because I'm I'm hiding, flanking, yeah, and I have three instances of disadvantage. So like, what's my actual modifier here? It's like now just like do one. Yeah. Just, and just... normally I agree with that. The 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 major instance when I that sucks hard mm-hmm. is rogue sneak attack yeah because you can have a million advantages and one Mm -hmm. disadvantage and you don't get sneak attack at all (laughs) so that sucks (laughs) needs buff at that point it's like i don't do anything i only attack once and if i don't have sneak attack i'm not doing any damage i think if you were like i have thought about this and if it really feels bad to like not reward or like pe- penalize a player in this, I would say like you could change the DC of whatever the thing is. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, yeah. Like it, in the instance of combat, like maybe you just re- like, okay, they've got a lot of instances of advantage and like maybe one instance of disadvantage. I'm going to lower their AC in this instance. Like you've got a really good angle on them. It's like opposite <laughs> of cover, you know? Okay. So, but yeah, that's just one of those things. It's like, like you said, they they obviously did it for simplicity because it 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 can get ridiculous, and no one wants to right. spend. Like, combat's already very long. It's because it's the most yes. it's the most rules heavy part of the game, and making it go slower is something that most people don't want to do. Yeah. Um, I guess that's the last thing I had. Oh, I did want to touch on one more thing, and that is yes. ability checks and their inability to crit rules as written. How do you feel about that? I doesn't the DMG mention the optional rule for like auto success? Um, I think it's somewhere where it's like some people play with this rule. I don't know. I know that I everywhere like I've fumbles. Seen it, yeah, I know there's optional rule for fumbles and optional rules for the way that crits work in combat, but I don't think I've ever seen it where it mentions that ability checks can crit everywhere I've seen it. It says that there's a DC and you got to meet it or beat it. I think Um, that, I mean, like I, I'm in favor of it, but I think that with ability check, like in combat, if you crit like one specific outcome occurs, mm -hmm. like you, and you could decide what that is, whether you doubled your damage dice or whatever. Right. But like with an ability check, like how you crit, could be determined by the dm like people always talk about like i'm a bard and i'm gonna persuade a king to give me his kingdom it's like <laughs> well you got a crit that means he doesn't kill you like <laughs> you know what i mean yeah like, that's i think on ability checks it's different because like the outcomes could be so numerous you know so yeah. and that's fair there's I- the way that like certain DCs are set, especially things mm-hmm. that are like not supposed to not when you when a DM like writes them out, they're not supposed to be able to be done by characters below a certain level, right? Yes. Like yeah. this is gonna be this high of a of a DC. You're not supposed to be able to do this without being at least level twelve or so or some yeah. whatever. And then if a level one character comes up and crits, if I don't want to be like, oh yeah, you did it. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
You I totally unlocked think... this box that stumped the entire kingdom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I also think that if you are slavishly faithful to it, then you diminish the importance of specialized roles. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a wizard. I rolled an 18 on my like history check. That I've got like a plus eight, so a 26 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like. And then you get the barbarian. It's like, hey, I set the DC for thirty because, like, this is, like, you have found a very specific thing from an ancient civilization, and there's no information about it. <laughs> and he's like, nat uh, twenty for a total of sixteen. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, got it. Like, oh, okay, well, the wizard couldn't figure it out, but you for free. I think you have to be mindful of that. So, like, I like the idea of rewarding when a two zero comes up. Mm -hmm. Because it's fun when our clickety clack shiny things do the things that we like, <laughs> but I also like, hey, that twenty awesome. That's gonna be cool for a total of what? <laughs> it could be extra, extra awesome, or like, you are the barbarian, so like <laughs> you figured this this out, but like I can't give you what the wizard also would have gotten if they crit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And a way that I, I mean, I've, I've been doing it sort of behind the scenes a lot when I DM, I'll just, I will adjust the DC if they crit. Um, but the way that I think I'm going to consistently do it is on, I will, I will set a DC and leave it there, but on a crit, you, I will, I will add your proficiency bonus to it. And if you already have okay. proficiency, I will add it again. So if, if your proficiency oh, bonus is five. Cool. And you're, I dig that. And you have um, a five in the relevant stat, so you would add be adding ten, and you nat twenty mm -hmm. for a total of thirty. If the DC was thirty two, I would and you crit, I would add another five to that, so you would have gotten a thirty five. Yeah, that's cool. I and dig if, that. It's like expertise, you, right? Yeah. Or if you have expertise, I would then add it a third time. So yeah. And if you roll a natural one, I would subtract it, because there oh, are some things that. Like especially for like rogues, once you get reliable talent, you count anything under a uh, under a ten as a ten. Mm -hmm. But if you got a natural one, I would still count it as a ten, but I'm gonna subtract your proficiency bonus from it. That's nicer than what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> you no, get a one, you fail. Like, I don't want to give rogue. I don't because that's like a that's one of their things. Like oh, I finally hit the level where I get this. That's all you get at that yeah. level, and I don't want to take that away. But at the same I mean, time, I, you rolled a one. I'm going to give yeah. you some kind of penalty. So I I'll think that's the way away. I'm doing it from now on. <laughs> I would, I would take it away. You get two through 10. Like you get literally 90% <laughs> of the rolls, but you get a one, you going to suffer the consequences because <laughs> I think ones are just as fun as twenties. Absolutely. So. But, <sighs> I, I, I have one tiny one to Let's squeak you in the end. Rest. Okay. I hate, rests rest rules <laughs> they just stuck i don't like how you do them i don't have a better solution i don't like how michael does them i don't have a better solution i don't like rules as written because like i think that there's just not a good in between you know yeah there really like, isn't because just... that's one of the the things where you come to it and like well this is definitely a game and the other thing too that's true but like Let's, okay, we're going to take a short rest. And it, like the book says, like, no strenuous activity or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, in my mind, that means that, like, I don't want to allow you to make an ability check or a roll of any kind. It's like, can we take a short rest while we're, like, checking out the room or whatever? And I'm like, I mean, I want to give that to you, but, like, you're also intentionally doing something. And, like, what if that something means something? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I try to rule it as, because it says, it mentions in, in resting, nothing more strenuous, I think anywhere, uh, more strenuous than like reading a book or taking a watch. So it, it mentions taking right. a watch, but like actively investigating something, I feel like is not a restful activity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I hate rest, dude. <laughs> <laughs> They're so important to get in, but like. Yeah, and so the I have a hard time with just how punishing 
a like an adventure arc should be right which is why i do rests the way i do in my campaign you're going to go do this thing and it's going to be taxing you're going to be walking all day every day and if you can just get a long rest every night Mm -hmm. if you can expend your entire like everything you got spell slots all the everything that you have if you can expend it and then be like well let's let's take a day (laughs) <laughs> Let's just take a rest yeah. and then get it all back. Then what mm-hmm. is like that, that sort of pacing yourself to yeah. me is part of the interesting thing. Like, you know, that something is coming. Yeah. You should take care to save what you think you're going to need. I think the counter argument is like, well, just construct your narrative a little bit differently. Like, if you have traditional rest rules, then like, okay, I need to like whittle my adventurers down to build up this element of suspense. Then like, okay, you, you took your rest, you get your long rest. you you know that you're going to happen upon the bandit camp here in a second. Okay. Well, I'm just going to throw, I don't know. It sucks. It sucks either way. As I'm describing this, I'm like, yeah, but that seems intentionally like you're trying yeah, to whittle. Exactly. Your like, just... <laughs> it's like, I was like, well, here's a random bunch of stuff that, didn't yeah. need to be there and doesn't really have any any thematic reason to be there. <laughs> the bandit camp is actually a dungeon that you can delve into and there's a really bad thing down there. Okay, there you go. Better. All better. Yeah, there fixed. You go. I so fixed that's, it. That's the thing. Rests are definitely a Rest very weird fuck. thing. Hate breath. <laughs> Nobody likes them. Everybody loves them. When you when you're a player and you just get to do them whenever you want, yeah. <laughs> I get to click the button, I get all my stuff back. And part of that is great. Like I enjoy, as a player, I definitely enjoy being like, just having an idea of when my next rest is going to come, right? Mm-hmm. So that's good because you're like, well, I I ha- I should probably try to pace myself at least until this point when I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to get a long rest. Yeah. Versus, well, I have no idea when my long rest is coming. So I guess I'll just only use spells. Not. if they Keep me alive. <laughs> yeah. Cantrips until the big thing comes. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. I don't like that. Cause it just feels like, uh... yeah, it's on one hand it's, it's cool and gritty. But on the other mm. hand, as far as it's it being a game and using the mechanics, it does it does it does dampen things a bit for me. I think it like yeah, both thoughts because I think it diminishes like okay, I'm this caster, I get to cast my cool spell like once every month, maybe. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like listening to critical role and stuff like that where they they kind of followed a traditional rule like mm-hmm. i have decided i'm done saving my spells or whatever cuz yeah. they all like blow they blow their loads and it works out fine for them so mm-hmm. like i might as well just hit it so yep and there's i mean there's a couple instances in critical role where matt's been like you got to conserve <laughs> after you know they've had mm-hmm. something that like that they didn't realize was going to be longer than it was or whatever right and those i mean those instances i think are fun to watch i don't know about if I was playing it, well, if I was playing it, I'd probably be fine with it too, because it's yeah. such a, it's not a thing that happens like constantly, I guess. I don't know. Right. I, anyway. uh, <laughs> it's tough. Tough. Rests. It's no good solution. It yeah. It's like, it's very like, I guess there's, there've been some suggested ones where it's like, every time you rest, you get, you like convert all your spell slots into spell points and you get a certain percentage of them back when you, whenever you rest. I don't know. I don't like that either. I it like becomes complicated. Yeah. That's the problem is that like, if you want a solution, you got to complicate. I like kind of like a final fantasy model, like in the original final fantasy, like there were levels of like restorative items that you could get. Like we got a tent. I don't remember. We got a cabin. Yeah. You got a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, oh, sweet. We get everything back. So I kind of like that idea of like, You'd have to really establish it with your players before you played. Yep. Because, like, you don't want to make... I'm just going to make a judgment ruling and say this doesn't count as a long rest because you're sleeping in the in the swamp. Yeah. And then it's... Um, but even if you do that, it becomes, like, okay, I got to go uncheck the certain spell slots that I get back. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I I think it's like hey, I don't know. Like part of me is just like you made it to the city, like you know that you're gonna be protected, guarded, mm-hmm. warm meal, like instant long rest in this place. But like while you're on the road, I don't know. I don't. Know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's very tough to do. It's why the the rules that I have in my campaign, I've I've talked with everyone about them over and over again, and yeah. I've sort of settled on where we are. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. and this is just my opinion, but I think yours are close. I just think in instances where we arrive, like you make us wait an additional day mm-hmm. to get the long rest. Yep. I don't like that. <laughs> I would say like, hey, we we got to the Hilton, like. I'm going to get a bath tonight. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be well rested tomorrow. Well, see, I've thought about it in a, in a reality sense too. If I had walked yes. for three days and then gotten to the Hilton, I'd, the next day I'd be like, I'm just going to lay in bed all day. <laughs> the counter, counter argument is okay. fair. Absolutely. So it's, now it becomes a choice. I get, I get it. I get it. I get it. So, yeah, it's not even. But, but all right. Anyway. That's all I got. Um, yeah, that's, that's good for now. Okay, there's a lot of there's a lot more, but yeah, like, we may re- we may revisit this topic at some point. But until yeah. that point, we're gonna close the book on on bothersome rules. Uh, so yeah, thanks for chatting with me. Thanks for everyone for watching, mm-hmm. and we'll be back. Uh, I guess next Wednesday is when these are gonna come out. So, thanks for watching our talkie thing. Thanks for watching our talkie thing. Bye. I think we should unironically <laughs> call it that. The talkie thing. That should be the, should be the name of the show. We'll talk about it. We'll talkie talk about thing. the talkie thing. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye.